You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, teacher, mom, photographer, and chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. Today is November 7th, 2021, and this is episode 146 of Lighthearted. In a few minutes, we'll listen to a conversation with Nat Lyon, director and curator of the Marshall Point Lighthouse and Museum in Maine. Michelle, have you ever been to Marshall Point? I have been to Marshall Point many, many times. I've been there for sunrise, sunset, <laughs> middle of the day, middle of the night. It's it's a beautiful <laughs> place to be. What are you doing there at middle, in the middle of the night? It's a pretty bright light. You wouldn't think it, but it's a pretty bright light at night. So it can be tough to get star photos there at night. Ah, okay. I've been there, you know, a couple of hours before sunrise to get sunrise pictures. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful spot. It is. It is. I always think of it as peaceful. I've been there at sunset. I've been there in the snow after a snowstorm, which was yep. beautiful. So we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. But first, has anything happened on this date in Lighthouse history, Michelle? Yes. Something very important happened on November 7th, 1761. New London Harbor Light in Connecticut, the fourth lighthouse in the American colonies, was lighted for the first time. The 64-foot tall stone tower was paid for by money raised by selling lottery tickets. It was replaced by a taller stone tower in 1761, and that lighthouse still stands. It's the oldest lighthouse in Connecticut and is now owned by the New London Maritime Society. Also, on November 7, 1913, the French novelist and philosopher Albert Camus was born. He once said, quote, always go too far because that's where you'll find the truth, unquote. So, Michelle, let's tell everyone about Marshall Point Lighthouse and our guest. Sure, Jeremy. Port Clyde, one of the villages that comprised the town of St. George in Midcoast, Maine, became a busy port in the 1800s with granite quarries, tide mills for sawing timber, shipbuilding facilities, and fish canning businesses. To help mariners entering the harbor or passing to the west into Muscongas Bay, Congress appropriated funds for a light station at Marshall Point in 1831, and a rubblestone lighthouse tower was completed in the following year. The 31-foot brick and granite lighthouse that stands today was built in 1857. The new lighthouse was fitted with a fifth-order Fresnel lens showing a fixed white light. A bell tower with a 1,000-pound bell was added to the station in 1898. The original 1832 Keeper's House stood until 1895 when it was destroyed by a fire caused by lightning. The Colonial Revival Keeper's House, built after the fire, still stands. When the light was automated in 1971, the Fresnel lens was removed and replaced by a modern acrylic lens equipped with backup battery power. Also in 1971, a Loran, or Long Range Navigation Station, was located in the Keeper's House. This station sent a signal over a range of 14,000 square miles. By 1980, the equipment was considered outdated and the house was boarded up. Several years later, the St. George Historical Society undertook the restoration of the house. A committee raised money and the restoration was completed in 1990. The first floor now houses the Marshall Point Lighthouse Museum with exhibits on local history as well as life at the light station. Under the Main Lights program, the entire station, including the lighthouse, became the property of the town of St. George in April 1998. The lighthouse is still an active Coast Guard aid to navigation. In late 2016, the light was changed to an LED-type optic. You can visit the lighthouse and grounds all year, and the museum is open from May to October. Nat Lyon is the director and curator of the Marshall Point Lighthouse and Museum. I recently had the chance to talk with Nat. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking this morning with Nat Lyon of the Marshall Point Lighthouse and Museum in Port Clyde, Maine. Thank you so much for being with me today, Nat. I really appreciate it. Yep, no problem. So we are speaking just a few days before I'm going to be at Marshall Point with the U.S. Lighthouse Society tour group. I've been to Marshall Point. I can't begin to say how many times. It's certainly dozens of times. 
uh, over the years since the 1980s. I'll talk more about my first visit there in a few minutes, but uh, it is absolutely one of the most picturesque light stations in New England. You know, it's certainly uh, up there on my list of, of favorites. It's, it's such a pretty place. So, Nat, uh, first of all, uh, before we talk about the lighthouse, which is mostly what we're going to talk about today, the light station, the museum and everything there, uh, let me ask you, uh, how did you personally get involved with the Marshall Point Lighthouse and Museum? I was born in Marblehead, Mass., and when I moved up here to the St. George Peninsula, a gentleman who I had played with as a kid in Marblehead was on the board of the Marshall Point Lighthouse and Museum Committee. And... They were recruiting, so he asked me if I might be interested in in joining the board. And I have always liked to give back to our community. And Marshall Point, as you have said earlier, is a very special place as far as lighthouses go. So I welcomed the opportunity, and that was some 10 years ago when when I joined the committee. I don't know you're from Marblehead, Mass. I'm from Lynn, Mass, which is right right near Marblehead. (laughs) And yeah. growing up, if somebody took a while to catch on to something, of course, we'd say dawn breaks on Marblehead or something to that that effect. So, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, I love Marblehead Mass. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the Marshall Point Light Station. First, uh, can you tell me why was a lighthouse built there in the first place in the uh, early 1830s? Well, if you recollect back then, there were no interstate highways. There were no U.S. Route 1s, and a lot of the shipping was done by coastal shipping boats, lumber, uh, granite, all sorts of products were up and down the coast. And so obviously the need to to identify some of the rocks, uh, some of the islands, some of the different going from one bay to another in the harbors. And so the uh, government bought a parcel of land from the Marshall family and in 1832, and it's rumored that the original stone for the lighthouse came from the Brothers Islands, which are just off of Marshall Point. And the first lighthouse was built in 1832. Yeah, definitely a need for you know navigational aids, as as we all know. And this is basically a great place to have have that lighthouse. Correct me if I'm wrong, during the civilian lighthouse service years at Marshall Point before the Coast Guard, uh, it was a family station there, I I believe, with one keeper uh, at a time living there with uh, their family. And one of the uh, keepers, Charles Skinner, was there for 45 years, which is really pretty amazing. I've only found uh, in my years of researching lighthouses, I think maybe only two or three keepers who are any, you know, at one station for longer than that. It's very rare. Uh, he was there from 1874 to 1919. What can you tell me about Charles Skinner and his family? Well, we have been able to reproduce the logs of all our, our lighthouse keepers. And um, he was, as you say, first appointed in 1874. And I've kind of skimmed through all of them. And it appears that he did such a great job that he was reappointed when the time came to be be reappointed. His first salary was $46 a week, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so he raised his family there and um, obviously did a, uh, a job that was acceptable by the government because also during the time, uh, some of the lighthouse appointments were very well connected to political connections. And um, some of our lighthouse keepers were moved on because someone had a political favor or someone changed parties. But uh, but Mr. Skinner was, was there for the 45 years. Interestingly enough, and when the Coast Guard shut the lighthouse down, and we'll get into this obviously later, but when the... Uh, Marshall Point Lighthouse Committee, through the Historical Society, renovated it. When they opened the um, museum in 1990, both uh, Charles's daughters were there to celebrate the opening of the museum and the keeper's house. Mm -hmm. And they were both well in their 90s. So we have that documented in, in the lighthouse. 
Yeah. Oh, that's is, that's is so amazing. That's so great that they were there. And I, I believe I remember seeing uh, at least one, maybe more than one photo of them when there were girls at the light station there. Yeah, we have an immense volume. We have 76 volumes of the history of the St. George Peninsula, but we also have like seven or eight volumes that deal nothing with Marshall, but with Marshall Point Light and then with uh, the town of Port Clyde and, or the village of Port Clyde and the village of Tenants Harbor. And we're a resource for families who want to come and look in our our index and find out about articles about their ancestors that we have in our in our resource room. Right. I was going to ask you, uh, I haven't been there in a couple of years, but I'm remembering that there's that, what you're calling a resource room, where people can actually, uh, when they go in the museum, they can peruse uh, those materials kind of uh, on their own. Is that right? Absolutely. Yep. They yeah. can't take them out, but they can look yeah. at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. I remember uh, one of the times I was there uh, spending some time flipping through those uh, those volumes. It's a yeah. nice thing to make available. Uh, are there any other stories of keepers and families that lived there over the years that kind of stand out in your mind? Well, you know, we always think that, that, that lighthouse keepers are famous for saving people that either crash on the rocks or get in their boats and row out. We've only had one instance where there was a sailboat uh, coming out of Camden and shouldn't have been out, and it was horrible weather, and they went up on the rocks uh, at Marshall Point, and it was a husband and wife, and the, and the husband unfortunately got swept away and drowned, and, and a lighthouse keeper. Then Ralph Banks was able to save the uh, the wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have records of family thanking him profusely for for what he did for for her, and um, so that's that that from <laughs> an historical point of having having affected a life saving event. That's that's the only event that that I know on record that 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 happened. Yeah. It always seems peaceful to me when I'm there. Maybe I've just never been there in a storm, but I imagine it was. Uh, considered a, a nice place. Obviously, it must have been a nice place for the Skinner family. They were there 45 years, but compared to a lot of the island light stations in Maine, it was certainly a kind of a sedate, uh, good place to, to be a, a keeper, I would say. Well, you, you got to look at it from the other standpoint, too. Getting assigned to a land-based lighthouse was sure as heck a lot better than being either out of Monhegan or Two Bush or you know, where uh, you either had to wait for the supply ship to come or you had your own boat and headed for shore and and hoped that the weather was going to let you return to get supplies and everything. So an assignment like Marshall Point was a plum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. One of the th first things that people see when they go there, they park in the parking lot and walk over to the, the lighthouse and keeper's house. But near the house, there's an old fog bell on the grounds. Please uh, explain that, that bell to me. Was that actually used at one time as the fog signal there? Yes. Prior to foghorns, the fog bell tower was kind of a, like a pyramid thing, it was, and the bell was obviously facing seaward, and it was run by a clock mechanism. And the keeper would have to come out and wind it every four hours because it struck the bell every four seconds. Mm -hmm. And it was right on the shoreline, yeah, I guess I say with a bell facing out to the sea. The interesting little antidote to this is that when the Coast Guard decommissioned the bell and put the foghorn up, the people who lived out on Marshall Point almost rebelled. They hated the sound of the of the foghorn, and I think they were ready to go to Congress to see if they could get the bell returned. Yeah. But uh, yes, that's that's uh, that's the bell that was uh, <clears throat> at the Marshall Point uh, yeah. bell tower. That's not the only case of people being up in arms with uh, foghorns back in those days. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. A number yeah. number of times when that kind of thing happened. That area, and you mentioned Monhegan Island a minute ago. Monhegan certainly known for artists, but the the whole area has attracted a lot of artists over the years. Uh, the very famous American artist Andrew Wyeth. Painted at least a couple of scenes at Marshall Point, I believe. Uh, can you tell me um, anything about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not. I mean, we are Wyeth country. There's no question about it. The only, the only three, and one was uh, 
a an illustration of Marshall Point that was on a calendar, mm-hmm. Times and Tide calendar. Um, and the others was when NC was an illustrator and he illustrated a couple of of ads for Coca Cola, you know, with a little girl uh, outside of Dory, and and in the background you could just see uh, Marshall Point Lighthouse. But I am not aware of any portrait uh, that they actually sat down and he painted. Um, either he, Andy, or Jamie. Jamie, yeah. Uh, have painted Marshall Point alone. Um, so we do have a we have a signed copy of the uh, calendar print that's that's in our museum. Yeah, for people listening who might not know, I think probably most people do, but uh, N. C. Wyeth was the father of Andrew Wyeth, and Jamie Wyeth is the the son of Andrew Wyeth. So three generations of uh, great artists who spent a lot of time around mid coast Maine. And uh, yeah, Jamie painted the fog bell at Monhegan and other scenes around there. And Jamie Wyeth, while we're on the subject, owns a lighthouse near near you, uh, also part of the town of St. George, right? In the Tenants Harbor. Absolutely. Village. He owns Southern Island. One of my little gigs this summer is that Linda Bean has a, a tour boat that does Wyeth tours. Mm-hmm. And we do Southern Island one day. We do go up the river up to the Cushing side and then go out to the islands for the Allen and Benner experience. So I have. I have been drilled into the Wyeth heritage <laughs> this summer. Yeah, yeah I've uh, I've spent a number of uh, times at uh, Whitehead Island, where I've uh, given yep. talks on New England lighthouses, where they have a they have kind of an education uh, facility there that they run. Um, and we've done boat tours where we go by Tenants Harbor or Southern Island Lighthouse, where Jamie Wyeth lives. And one time he came out and blasted a little cannon for us as we passed by. So that was. Oh yeah, neat. that's his. That's one of his favorite things to do. If he if he's on Southern and um, and he feels so like it that he will let you get shot by his cannon. Yeah, yeah, I got a good picture of him lighting the the fuse of yeah. the cannon. Yeah. And uh, I, and I, while I have while we're talking, I, I will tell your your listeners that. Southern Island is probably the most historically restored and kept lighthouse that I'm mm-hmm. aware of. They have everything. They have the fuel shed that had to be separated when they went to kerosene. He's got the fog bell right in the front. You've got the keeper's house. The whole thing is, is just, they've really, really done a great job in preserving it. Yeah, it is very beautiful, and you're right. It's a very complete uh, light station. And the Fog Bell Tower, I believe, is uh, his art studio? I'm not sure. I cannot confirm that because he's built other buildings behind the lighthouse since he, he bought it essentially from Andy and Betsy, and that's when Andy and Betsy moved out to uh, Allen and Benner. Yeah. So, and and he's not always there. He does have a place in Tenants Harbor, and he spends a lot of time out of Monhegan. But when he's there, he is there. The presence is known. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I believe his father, Andrew, when he owned it, made the bell tower into an art studio. And he did a very famous painting called Dr. Sin of a skeleton and like a an old Navy uniform sitting in the yeah. bell tower, kind of looking out. That's uh, one of my favorite Wyeth paintings. <laughs> So uh, let's uh, change the subject a bit. The uh, the old fifth order Fresnel lens that was used at, at Marshall Point Lighthouse was removed when the light was automated in 1971, and I, I think it was displayed for a while at the Coast Guard Station in Rockland. Nobody mm-hmm. seems to know what happened to it. Uh, I know there's been a, a hunt for that. Has there been any progress in that search? As you know, we were able to get our, our barrel lens from the uh, the lighthouse museum in Rockland. Right. And during that time of, of negotiating between the Coast Guard, who owns all the, all the material in there, and us, we were discussing the um, where our Fresno lens went. I have an idea, and I, I, it's just intuition for me. I think I know where it is. It's local. And I think at some point we will get it back, but that's 
all I can all I can tell you right now. I I yeah. I, I mean if it was on display at the Rockland Coast Guard Station, and, and and this is when they were getting ready to open their first museum, and all of a sudden it it disappeared. Um, there's a lot of history and a lot of speculation, but there are some things said during the transition that I I just put two and two together, and I I do think I know where it is, but I'm not at liberty to speculate. Okay, <laughs> sure. No, I understand. Well, I I'd love to see it back there, but it's at least you. Right now, like you said, you have that uh, drummer barrel lens that was also used there on display. Yeah. So I first visited Marshall Point in the 1980s. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what year it was. Maybe, I'm going to guess maybe 86. Uh, the house was boarded up at that time. Uh, the Coast Guard had uh, automated the station. They had, I know they had a Loran uh, long-range navigation uh, system there for a while, and they shut that down. When I was there with my wife, there was a sign. The book, the house, again, was all boarded up. There was a sign on the house that said, We Need Your Help. It asked for donations to the St. George Historical Society. So I was super happy not too long after that when the uh, the place was restored and the museum was open. Could you say maybe a little bit more about that, about how the Historical Society saved the light station at that time and opened the museum? Yeah, as as you said, in, in 1971, when the lighthouse became fully automated, it was the end of the need for a lighthouse keeper. And the Coast Guard decided to put a Loran station in, in, in the keeper's house. As an aside, unfortunately, when they decided to do this, and we have no understanding why, they took down the summer kitchen, they took down the burn, and they took down the lifeboat station. For what mm-hmm. reason, we have, have no idea. However, the keeper's house was intact, and they moved out in in 81. And uh, so it was boarded up, and it became um, kind of a party place for locals and everything. However, uh, in the late 80s, there surfaced a rumor that someone was going to build a hotel out there. And so that automatically... I sounded the alarm, and the uh, St. George Historical Society decided that they would get some type of an agreement with the Coast Guard and proceed to restore the building. So this all happened in 1988, and that was about the time when, when you were there. And they raised the money to restore the keeper's house. A lot of it was done by members of the society. Of, of the of the committee, and they opened in 1990, rented out the keeper's quarters as a source of income because we don't get any grants or anything from anybody. We're an all-volunteer organization. The only one we pay is our bookkeeper for obvious reasons, and we rely on the rent from the keeper's house, which is yearly, not weekly. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. And um, donations and what we get from our museum shop. So, uh, end of any speculation about hotel. And uh, three years later, or 1993, they added the summer kitchen back. And then I see there's something you want to talk about the brand later. That was my my project of restoring a while back. So. Aside from the bell tower, and we are a historical site, we have to comply with all the rules and regulations. So everything is basically authentic to the point where last year during the COVID, we were doing our our cycle of maintenance on the keeper's house and some of the trim had rotted. And it wasn't the type you could go to Home Depot or Lowe's and get it. We had to have it computer generated so that it would match what we had there, mm-hmm. which was kind of a more of an expense that we had we had run into. But that's the specifications that we we have to keep, and and we've been very good with that. Well, since you mentioned it, let's uh, talk about the barn. Historic barn was reconstructed fairly recently. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, we we have not had any place to store all of our artifacts. I mean, I have stuff in my house. Uh, the former curator had a barn full of stuff. There was stuff in the town vault. 
and it came to the point where we really needed to have some place to put it. We also had on campus a weather tower that flew the uh, small class warning flags or the hurricane or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And one of the keepers climbed halfway up and took a picture closest to the barn and then, you know, showed the keeper's house and everything. So when I brought up to the board the idea of resurrecting the barn, they said, oh, yeah, go ahead, take it on, Nat. So (laughs) I was able to, from that photo, through an engineering firm, just get the exact location of Mm -hmm. where the barn was and basically the dimensions of it. Then we had to work with the uh, people up in Augusta, um, the Preservation Commission up there, and get everything approved. And since we had granite quarries down here as part of the history of the peninsula, we were able to get uh, granite from St. George, which is the foundation of the barn. Mm -hmm. It's post and beam, and interestingly enough, the contractor was also a tenant in the keeper's house for three years. And so he had a sentimental connection to making sure that the the building uh, came out as authentic as it as it could, even to the windows. And we raised um, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. We we were fortunate to be able to take twenty five thousand of our own own money and put it in the till. And after a long prolonged winter and spring, uh, we have the burn and have been able to collect everything and put it under one roof and it's been indexed and waiting for the appraisal we haven't had anything appraised since uh, 1999 and that's going to be done and then upstairs in the barn is going to be our office Mm -hmm. where you know actually with a desk and a, a cloud computer and two or three file cabinets so we can have everything under one roof and uh, then I can start hopefully some rotation of the uh, of the displays in in the lighthouse. So everybody wants to know when we're going to rebuild the bell tower, and I said not in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the big problems is because of Shoreland Shoreland zoning and everything that where we would locate it. I'm I'm not sure we'd ever be able to get through the red tape. Uh, yeah. Ever. Yeah. So. We are as complete as as we can. We're authentic. Well, the barn is a, a great addition, both uh, for the historic look of the place and for your uh, your, uh, your needs, your space needs too. It sounds sounds great. Uh, the other thing yeah. we might do uh, is maybe put a passive display with a with a barn door opens. Uh, something that we wouldn't have to have a volunteer there, but would be able to show more of the, the artifacts and in, in, in our collection. So that's that's under consideration. You've also got the old oil house on the site, uh, which I think is a stone oil house, a little unusual. Most of them are brick. Right. Well, again, it basically is granite because we had the yeah. granite here. Uh, yeah. The base of it was granite, and we are, you know, stone. Um, and again, that was, uh, that was built when we went the transition from whale oil and the rest of the that to kerosene, we we had to keep it away from the from the, yep. the keeper's house for obvious reasons because of the volatility. Yeah, I guess they built it of stone rather than brick because the stone was so so handy there. So that makes sense. But it's a it's a nice nice little building. Uh, so you mentioned the house being rented, the upstairs of the house uh, being rented to to people over the years and. Two of the people who lived there from, I believe it was 1989 to 2002, uh, Tom and Leanne Zellog. Uh, Tom is a great photographer, very accomplished photographer, and they put together a book uh, about their years there. Can you tell me about that? I, I think the book that, that they put together is actually a masterpiece. We are very lucky to have them, and Leanne was actually on the board. Mm-hmm. Um when she was there, and uh, obviously their love for the lighthouse and their their love for photography, it's a book that that I have, and I you know we happen to sell it in the <laughs> in the shop. 
but his his ability to capture you know some of the photographs in there are just it's just great and we we're fortunate to have him yeah oh yeah it's a beautiful book it's called uh, our point of view 14 years at a main lighthouse and, mm-hmm. uh, as you said it is still still available in your museum and from from other sources and i recommend yep. it very highly i think uh, he had uh, I think maybe at least, I know at least one, but I think more than one cover of Down East magazine shot there as well. I think there was one of a baby seal on the rocks uh, at the lighthouse, if I remember right, on Down East. Do you remember that one? Your memory's better than mine. I, I, <laughs> okay. I don't think I've seen that, but you're probably right. Um, yeah, that one stood out in my mind. The seal. Uh, I mean, uh, I, if, if if I were to have a copy of of every photograph or every every artist rendition of Marshall Point life, like I don't think that I have a place to store them all. Another book that related to the place was the children's book, Nellie the Lighthouse Dog. I, I love that book. I often I often bring it on tours and show it to people. Uh, I think it had a couple of sequels about uh, Nellie the Dog. Uh, can you tell me about the, the background to, on that? Yeah, one of our volunteers had a had a dog and he brought the uh, George Ensor brought the the dog when he was volunteering and the dog was child friendly and um so after a while another member's uh wife who was a writer encouraged him to come up with a child's book called you know Nellie the Lighthouse Dog so Bob Ensor was an artist, so he did all the uh, all the artists in the book, and and Jane Scarpino, whose husband was on the board, then wrote wrote the uh, the literature of it, and it became uh, an instant hit. And then after Nellie passed away, there was one more sequel, and the book that we carry now is the original Nellie book. I generally work the the shop on Sundays, and I can't tell you how many older people come and say, "I remember that book being read to me. I'm going to buy it for my grandchildren." Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's part of our history, and uh, there is some sentiment to come up with with a uh, semblance of Nellie in place on the grounds that that's that's under consideration at the mm. moment. Uh, actually, as I as I said to you, I mean, many many people um, are familiar with it, and a lot of them buy it for their grandchildren. Yeah, because it is true. It, it it's got some history of Port Clyde. It's got some history of the of the lighthouse. But um, it's one of those unique situations where you never know what's going to happen, and and um, so this 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 was unique to to Marshall Point. Another thing that I'm sure you get asked about all the time, you know, and I almost hesitate to bring this up because you're probably talk, tired of talking about it, but <laughs> I, I have coming. to, yeah, yeah, I have to ask about Forrest Gump. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, I'm sure a lot of people listening, a lot of Lighthouse buffs know that a scene in the movie Forrest Gump was filmed at Marshall Point. Would you say that's the thing that people ask about the most? I think it's it's up there, but. And this was in 1993, and, and just so your listeners will will know, it was uh, four days of preparation for 60 Seconds of Glory right. for the film crew and the whole the whole deal. I mean, Tom came in, did his thing, and headed back out. He did sign a few autographs, and and uh, however, it's interesting because the only thing that we have <clears throat> two things in the lighthouse. Is is I have a poster of a Tom Hanks Forrest Gump film, and I have put on that poster photographs of him running up and running back. Yeah. And it's amazing how many times people will come through and say, "I didn't know that. I didn't know that." Yeah. And yet there are people who will come up, get out of their car have someone stand at the end of the walkway and yell, run, Forrest, run, and they'll run <laughs> up and back, get in their cars, and leave. Yeah. So the other other thing we have in the lighthouse, it's a uh, three-ring binder that shows all the preparations, uh, the film crew and, and the whole thing uh, when, they, when they did it. Yeah. So those are the only two things that, that we have for, for our 
Forrest Gump, but as I tell people, yes, the other name of the lighthouse is the Forrest Gump Lighthouse. Now, do I remember right that when they were preparing before Tom Hanks got there that his brother was a stand-in for him? Is that right? His brother was there, and I wasn't involved at at the time. Um, people have have accused the brother of doing the whole thing for for Tom, but that's no. not true. Tom was there, and yeah, yeah, it was it was interesting. And and again, it's it's um, just to give you some perspective is is that two years ago, uh, pre COVID. And our season starts in, in May, soft openings in May, the board takes that, and then from Memorial Day right through to Columbus Day, we're open seven days a week. And so we had 19,000 people go through the museum. And I can guarantee you there was another 20, 25,000 that didn't come in the museum, but goes to the grounds, they picnic, you've got artists coming in, you've got, as I've told you, people running up and, and doing the forest gum thing. So we are a, a spot for the St. George Peninsula that I say attracts roughly 40,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now, couple that with the Monhegan boat line that's running the ferry back and forth to Monhegan, certainly we attract a number of people at St. George Peninsula. And the ferry uh, passes by and gives a pretty good uh, view of the lighthouse when you're coming and going as well. People want to get a view from the water, too. They do. And interestingly enough, uh, when we were talking, I forgot to mention when we got on the bell and the foghorn, the foghorn now is activated by boaters on their VHF radio. They have to go up to a channel and click the mic five times, and that will activate the foghorn for 15 minutes. Yeah. And one of the things that some of the locksmen love to do on a perfectly beautiful, clear day, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll go by, and all of a sudden the foghorn will start. Yeah, <laughs> it'll yeah. Start going, and people are going, what's going on? There's no fog. But uh, yeah. I've experienced that uh, same thing uh, here at uh, Portsmouth Harbor Light near me. And, you know, most, a few of the main foghorns at uh, light stations are on 24 hours, but most of them are that Mariner activated system now. And I find right. the same thing. You almost never hear them in the fog anymore. But on bright, sunny days, you get somebody playing around or showing a friend, look what I can do with my radio yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Well, I think one of the um, the things that people uh, want to hear during the fog when they come to uh, a lighthouse as a foghorn. Yeah. So in our shop, we have a handheld BHF radio, and we can touch it off to ah, give them okay. yeah. authenticity of, yes, yes, we do have a foghorn. It does work. <laughs> and I just think that's part of the cachet when you come to visit a, yes. a lighthouse. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, so, but back to the work of your organization. Uh, yeah. Have have there are any other major restoration projects in recent years that we haven't talked about? No, I, I and I won't count it as restoration. But we finally decided that we needed a generator, and and so that's that's coming next spring because, as we all know, everything is way way behind order. And I've offered the use of our generator to the Coast Guard because they use battery backup for, for the light, and we haven't heard anything back from them. And other than that, I'm just trying to get the barn organized and a passive display. I don't know of anything on the, on the plate that, that we're, we're yeah. going to do any major restorations. I, I think what you see is what you get. And, and, of course, as you well know, the Coast Guard is only responsible for the light and the foghorn, Marshall Point Lighthouse, Museum uh, committee is responsible for the upkeep of, mm -hmm. of all the buildings, and yeah. um, so uh, just just keeping that <laughs> in shape is a <laughs> is a year round project. Yeah, well, the place you guys do a, a wonderful job. The place looks so good. You know, I I gave lighthouse tours uh, for about eleven years uh, in my minivan based here in Portsmouth, and I usually brought people just as far as Portland. But it, occasionally, I did a mid coast main tour and drove up to your area, and I brought a number of people to to Marshall Point during those years. And one thing I always did for them, and they th always uh, thought it was a lot of fun, was we would stop at the town offices, the St. George town offices. 
so yep. people could uh, take pictures of the the life size. Well, I don't know how, how if you could say a life size uh, statue of a dragon. I don't know how big a dragon really is, but there are metal sculptures there of Saint George fighting the dragon. Yep. Uh, can, is there a little background to that? I've never been sure why um, it's the town uh, and the the peninsula there came to be called Saint George. And uh, if, I don't know if listeners know about Saint George and the Dragon, the famous uh, legend. But yeah. 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 Okay, a little little history lesson. In the early 1600s, there was a captain from England, uh, George Weymouth, who anchored between Allen and Benner Islands. And he named Monhegan St. George's or St. George Island. Mm. And while they were anchored there, they were on an exploration to see if there was any commercial uh, potential. They went up the St. George River. And so when the town got incorporated, they just inherited the name of St. George. And I think that and, and I'm not sure either St. George is a patron saint or King George was the king at the time when Weymouth did his exploration. So um, that's how the St. George Peninsula got its got its name. And as you well know, you pay your taxes to the town of St. George, but there are little villages, Port Clyde, Martinsville, Tenants Harbor, Clark Island, Smalley Town, you know, little little sections of, of the peninsula. So a gentleman by the name of Danny Daniels, uh, who um, sculptured in, in metal medium and everything, decided that he would, would build this and give it to the town of St. George and where it is now, as you well know, prominently displayed in the town office uh, complex. As, as an aside, I, I had a call the other day from a lady who has an osprey that uh, Danny did, and, and she wanted to know if we might like it up at uh, Marshall Point. So we're in negotiations. Uh, I've looked at it. I think it would be really neat to, to add out in the wild part, as long as we can get two, two feet down for the pedestal on it without hitting a rock. Um Again, it's, you know, we're just not, you know, Marshall Point Light and everything about the lighthouse and its history. We're a history of the St. George Peninsula. So when you come into the lighthouse, you get a section devoted to the quarry. You get a, a quilt that was has uh, local scenes in it um, that was done by the Port Clyde Baptist Church. You get... Mm -hmm. Original cook stove that was in the summer kitchen, the sardine factory, the fishing, and everything, you know, the keepers. And we've got one, two, at least three of the lenses uh, that were were part of, of the light. So um, it, it's all part of, of keeping the history of the peninsula. And so uh, there, there was a President Selectman now in, in in St. George, but he kind of became a, a student of Danny's, and and there are some of Randy's um, sculptures around. I I think in in his dad's yard as you come down 131, yeah. you made a few deer, a few bear, and and yep. that was was Randy's work, but he kind of apprenticed and 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 did with Danny. So that's that's a scoop on the uh, St. George and the Dragon and. Um, Obviously, we're very proud of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad you explained that. I was going to ask you about the other uh, animal, metal animal sculptures near there. I was curious about those. So now I now I know. Thank you. So back to the museum. We're we're winding yep. and winding down here. Just got a couple more questions for you. Let me just ask about the the museum again. Uh, it's obviously seasonal because it is Maine and. Uh, you can't really be open in the winter, but what is the season for the museum, when, and when is it open during the season? Okay, um, I mentioned it once before. I'll do it again. We, we the board, open weekends, uh, what we call our soft opening, in May. Uh, this is to to make sure that all the bells and whistles are in place, and that some of us who have been rusty can brush up and 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 get everything ready. And then we go full bore from Memorial Day. 
right through Columbus Day, and we're open seven days a week. Right now, our schedule is Sunday and Monday, we're open from 12 to 4, Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. Mm-hmm. Now, you have to understand, we're an all-volunteer organization, and we need two people to cover those hours. One's the meter and greeter, so when you come through the door, you're properly greeted. And the, the, the little history of bit, we have a couple of pass-outs, timelines, and histories that uh, you can take with you. Um, and then, obviously, we have to have someone in, in the museum shop to handle all the sales and everything. Yeah. yeah. So it's quite an undertaking uh, especially since um, I think our, our youngest volunteer is probably 56. The rest mm-hmm. of us are, are up there. So in deference, we try to do two-hour shifts uh, that's more comfortable for people yeah. rather than four-hour shifts. But we've been very fortunate this year to be able to, to cover everything. And as I as I said earlier, it reflects the history of the St. George Peninsula, but it also includes so much of the lighthouse and how the lighthouse was saved and renovated. And there's obviously books that you can look at, at how it was done. Uh, we've got um, everything is, is is available for for you to see. Yeah. So and and we uh, will just mention we've um, this year we've we've had LL Bean has done two catalog. Photo shoots, uh, one just happened last Sunday. We've had uh, Buick Car Magazine uh, film an advertisement uh, this summer. Last summer, there was a cook-off between Gordon Ramsley of uh, TV Cook fame and Melissa Kelly of our primos here in, in Rockland, and it was under the auspices of the National Geographic we have weddings, we have uh, funerals. On our website, there are applications to to either have a photo shoot or an art shoot or any events. Uh, you know, have to be okayed because of you well know the <laughs> the, the wide highway we have to our oh, yeah. athletes. And so we uh, are, are very busy and and just try to make it. You know, easy for everybody. We don't restrict anybody. Although we did close the lighthouse for one day for for the uh, the Buick shoot. But other yeah. than that, yeah, and that's that's what the museum is and when we're open. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, a again a really beautiful place and a very friendly place to visit. Uh, every time I've been there, there everybody's been so nice so and i want to mention the um, website is marshallpoint.org right yep 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 so there's and, and we it, have it looks a like... webcam so you can see the lighthouse when you get on there and there are all sorts of little subtitles history uh you know donate button and <laughs> gotta yeah. get that in <laughs> but it's really yeah. nice uh, we had some people from new york who wrote a letter and said that they we're not able to make it because of the COVID and they just really thank us for the webcam because it's one of their favorite places to come when they're here. Right. And also I just want to mention, I think the website was redone not that long ago, right? It's, it's really, really beautiful. No, we're neophytes and we're, we finally tapped into some professional people who could get us to where we are. And, um, and, I'm quite proud that, quote unquote, we went modern. And we're able to to get a website with everything yeah. in there. And, and, well, when uh, you when you yeah when you get on the website, there's some beautiful scenes like a, a drone footage of the the station yeah. And, yeah. and different yeah. views, and it's it's really nicely done. It's really beautiful. So again, Marshall Point Marshall dot org is the website. I have one final question for you. This is for yeah. for bonus for bonus points. So get ready. Uh, <laughs> What has been your favorite thing about your involvement with Marshall Point Lighthouse? Well, number one, when I moved up here in 98, I I just fell in love with it. I mean, being a marble header, I've been on the water all my life. And when when I moved up here, I got a job as a steerman on a lobster boat for nine years and, you know, just going in and out of the harbor and when I had the opportunity to um, to get on the board, as I said, I, I as I jumped on it, and and hopefully during my tenure, I've been able to add to the cachet and 
Yeah, I was interviewed oh, three or four years ago by a local TV station, and, and they wanted to ask basically the same question. And I said, well, you know, if you're a first-time visitor to the state of Maine and you come to Marshall Point, not only do you get the lighthouse, but you get to see the rocky shore, you get to see the islands, and you get to see the lobster buoys all in one vista. <laughs> and as you know, the vista looking out towards Allen Benner, uh, on a clear day, you can see Monhegan and Burn Island, and then, uh, you know, the little islands, the Gunning Rocks, the Brothers, and everything. And you actually get to see the lobster boats come back and forth. And if you're hit hit at the right time, you can see the Elizabeth Ann going out to Monhegan. So I, I think as a first-time experience for somebody, that it really, really defines the seacoast of Maine and the lighthouses and, and, and what we're all about. Yeah, that sums it up pretty well. And it's certainly one of the must-see lighthouses in Maine. Uh, I always recommend it to people if they're driving up the Maine coast. Uh, it's right very much uh, near the top of the list or at the top of the list. And uh, you just reminded me of something about the lobstermen and everything. I have a good memory of one time having breakfast at the restaurant in Port Clyde. I think maybe it's changed over the years. I'm not sure. This was a long time ago. I'm not sure what the name of the restaurant was, maybe yeah. 30, 30 years ago. But I was there by myself really early in the morning, and the, several lobstermen were sitting nearby me with uh, you know, ex extremely uh, thick Maine accents, which I love. And it was just, uh, you know, talk about local color. Uh, I really enjoyed that. But, um, you know, as you said, there's so many... Uh, it's a very unspoiled area. It doesn't feel like it's set up for tourists, you know, so that's what, another thing I, I love about it. So, Nat Lyon, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me today uh, to talk about one of the most uh, scenic uh, and uh, historic light stations in Maine. I look forward to being there in a few days with the U.S. Lighthouse Society tour, and I'm sure I'll be there many times uh, in future years as well. So, thank you so much, Nat. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it, too, and I hope to see you when you get up here Monday. To learn more about the Marshall Point Lighthouse and Museum, check out their website at marshallpoint.org. The book, Our Point of View, 14 Years at a Main Lighthouse, by Tom and Leanne Zellog, is available from Amazon and other online booksellers. Marshall Point is a very special place, as I'm sure many of our listeners know, and I know you know that, Michelle. Yes. And both of us have been there many times. One of my favorite memories is being there for a beautiful sunset after a snowstorm. That was just gorgeous, pretty special. I want to thank Nat Lyon for today's interview, and I also want to thank him and the other volunteers at Marshall Point for their hospitality when I was there with a U.S. Lighthouse Society tour a few weeks ago. Speaking of U.S. Lighthouse Society tours, you can find out about upcoming tours by going to uslhs.org. Next year's domestic tours include Texas, Yucatan, the Outer Banks, and the Hudson River. And the international tours include Ireland, Italy, Newfoundland, and Australia. The tours are amazing. They always include lots of lighthouses. You also get to learn about the culture of the places you're visiting. And while you're visiting the website at uslhs.org, be sure to check out the Passport Program and the Research Catalog and all the other things the Society offers. Remember that donations and memberships support this podcast. The American writer and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, and I quote, Life is a journey, not a destination, end quote. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine